Uh, without further ado, we can get into today's objective, which is to have a knowledge sharing space on gender specific interventions in communities for prioritization in the funding applications. And we have great and amazing regional leaders with us. We have Sita Sahi from ICW Asia Pacific. We have Olena Streisak and Sveta Moros from the uh, Aero Asian Women's AIDS Networks. And we have Helen Afa from ICW West Africa. They will share uh, with us about lessons learned and reflections during window one and two of the and the work they are doing at a regional level to support the participations of networks of women. As well, we have Angela from uh, Women for Global Fund sharing us some recommendations for the next windows and beyond. But we will also want to start this conversation with some reflections and recommendations from the Global Fund with the TRP report on gender equality. So I want to give the floor and welcome our first panelist, Ms. Thea Willis, who is the Equity Advisor of the Community Rights and Gender Department of the Global Fund. So Thea, welcome, and please go ahead. Thank you, Karen. And if you could project the slides, that would be fantastic. Hi, everyone. My name is Thea, and I work in the Community Rights and Gender Department in the Global Fund Secretariat. Thank you so much to the organizers for this brilliant webinar. I'm really happy to be here with you. I'm only going to talk very quickly, and I'm just going to give you some high level reflections from window one on gender equality. If you move to the next slide, now these reflections are based on observations from our technical review panel. And you'll know that the technical review panel is a panel of independent technical experts that review every single funding request that comes into the Global Fund. And they have review criteria on gender equality. And they have provided some reflections and feedback on window one. And I'm gonna share those with you. I'm not on the technical review panel and the secretariat, but I will share their reflections with you. And then I will also share some reflections that we've had from the secretariat level and um, from our own review of, of funding requests. In window one. Before I get onto that, I just wanted to really quickly recap on, on where gender equality is positioned for the Global Fund in the new strategy. We're really pleased that it is um, front and center of our strategy as, a, as an objective. And we're really clear that we will not achieve our primary goal um, to end epidemics unless we maximize gender equality. And that's about removing gender related barriers to services, but it's also about being more gender transformative and tackling the underlying causes of gender inequality. And um, that's our ambition, and that's what we've been trying to achieve for this grant cycle. If you move on to the next slide, very quickly, just some of the changes that we made at secretariat level to try and better embed gender equality um, in this grant cycle. So we strengthened the funding request requirements, applicants had to demonstrate in greater detail how the interventions are going to maximize gender equality and be more gender transformative. We introduced a new program essentials based on normative guidance and best practice, and they include gender equality. We published a new gender equality technical brief which set, sets out our expectations on gender equality. We brought in a gender equality marker to assess um, how well gender equality is considered across every single component of every single funding request. And we brought in some new corporate key performance indicators to track how well we're doing as a funder, specifically in relation to gender equality. So there's some of the changes that we brought in. And then um, if we move to the next slide, we can see some of the feedback that we've had from the TRP on um, how well this has, been, this has been going. So you can see here, uh, and I've just circled um, the feedback from the TRP on gender. And in addition to reviewing each funding request, the TRP also provides an overview of the whole window. And they were asked to assess you know, whether funding requests maximize gender equality. And you can see here that um, the total of 70%, so they, the, the technical review panel felt that 70% of those funding requests in window one were maximizing gender equality by considering and addressing gender inequalities and gender related barriers. And I think this is tentatively encouraging because um, actually this is one of the biggest increases in um, scoring 
that we've seen from the last window. So the last funding cycle, um, the TRP assessor was 58%, and now we've gone up to 70% in total. So I think there's a, 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 an encouraging sign, but we're still a huge amount of um, effort and progress needed in particular areas. Um, some of the positive areas that the TRP noted is that more gender and human rights assessments were being conducted as part of funding requests, which is a really positive step forward. Um, they found some really encouraging examples of more gender transformative programs, for example, thinking about women community health workers and how to make programming and um, how to make their working conditions safer. Um, reducing the risk of gender-based violence. Um, so there are some positives coming out there as well, but as I say, a huge amount of progress still needed. And if we move on to the next slide, we can see some of the areas where the TRP noted um, that we still have a lot to do. And the first one is around comprehensive gender assessments. Now, they did find that more assessments are being conducted but it's certainly not um, comprehensive. So not every funding request is being informed by an assessment of the gender inequalities in the context. And really importantly, they also flagged that not all gender assessments include or are completed with the meaningful participation of women and girls, which we know is absolutely critical. So this is an area where we really encourage um, applicants to do more to make sure that gender assessments are being conducted, but they're being conducted with a meaningful participation of those <laughs> who know best about the context that they're assessing. Secondly, the TRP noted that um, sometimes when the gender assessment has been conducted, the findings of that assessment are not always then reflected in the activities and the budget that are contained in the funding request. So, so an area that we really want to focus on for for future windows is making sure that there's that really strong link between the findings of the assessment and then what's proposed in the funding request. The TRP also found that um, a lot of essential activities relating to gender equality were not being contained in the main budget allocation. They were being placed in the PAR and the PAR is what we call, um, you know, what a country would implement, those activities they would implement if they got extra funding but they're not suggesting that they use the, the, the core allocation for that. So it really means that those activities are much less likely to be funded. So we really want to try and see more gender equality activities budgeted for in the main allocation. Um, the TRP also recommended us to, recommended for applicants to follow the recently issued guidance on adolescent girls and young women. Um, that was released by the Global HIV Prevention Coalition and UNAIDS, and they found this to be a really useful prioritization tool. And one of their recommendations was um, for us to be using this more and, and to differentiate services more according to intersectionality for women. So thinking about young women who might sell sex or young women who use drugs, for example. So that intersectionality piece was really key. And then finally, another observation, um, which is sadly you know, has always been a challenge in that they, they found that there was still a long way to go in terms of collecting and using sex and or gender disaggregated data for prioritization. So that's another key area of focus. And then the final slide for me, if we move on to the next one, um, I just wanted to give you a couple of other reflections from the Global Fund Secretariat we we saw during our funding request review all of those issues that the TRP has raised and in total alignment with them. And then a couple of other issues that we have noticed is that when gender is considered, a lot of the time or very often it's considered in relation to, as a as a sort of barrier to service access. And that is obviously a really crucial dimension. But what we saw less of was consideration of gender more holistically, so how it relates to people's risk, to their vulnerability, um, to their health outcomes, even once they've managed to access health services. 
and consequences of poor health. So, so trying to encourage thinking about gender more holistically in addition to um, the way in which it affects people's access to healthcare services in particular. And then secondly, in line with the, the strategy ambitions that I showed you earlier, we really want to encourage funding requests to try and be more gender transformative. So that means tackling the underlying causes of gender inequality, rather than just kind of identifying and dealing with the symptoms of gender equality. So being more gender transformative and trying to maximize gender equality as well. So they are the high level reflections from the technical review panel and from us in the community rights and gender department. And I think the overall headline is some encouraging progress from the TRP, but still a very long way to go in terms of gender equality. I'm very happy to take any questions and look forward to hearing from the other speakers. Thanks. Thank you, Thea. I see we have uh, questions. I was sharing my screen right now. Oh, no, they were just telling me that the chat was disabled. Uh, but we have a section in Q&A at the end if you have any questions regarding the TRP day of birth. But it's interesting to see how the first and the second window came out and that we have to push and, and, and dab on that gender transformity, but also holistically way on how to engage women then with HIV. And, um, and with that, I want also to share some of the experiences on the ground, some of the experiences of networks of women living with HIV. And I want to give the floor to Sita, Sita Sahi from ICW Asia Pacific to share us, to share with us how is the region working with networks in a regional level. So Sita, please go ahead. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us uh, today uh, with this webinar. Uh, my name is Sita Sahi. Uh, I'm the regional coordinator of ICW Asia Pacific um, based in Bangkok, and I'm working um, since, uh, you know, 2015 with this organization. Um, thank you, Karen, for inviting us and organizing this um, webinar, uh, which, is, which is really fruitful for all of the participants and all of us as well to learn more. You know, and um, I think I should start from the uh, why uh, we uh, initiated uh, the current um, initiative. So the movement of women living with HIV in Asia Pacific region is really being saddled um, during you know this period of time, um, basically after the COVID as well. And the network of women living with HIV in Asia Pacific region lacks uh, long-term support to address health issues and uh, needs of women and girls living with HIV and their concerns are really largely ignored. So that was the reason uh, we really came up with the idea. And then, you know, um, we hold ICW AP feminist leadership training with the six countries through the support of TSM UNHCRST in 2022. And that, that training was uh, really to build the capacity of women and girls living with HIV to engage in the design and monitoring of the programs and uh, services that promote gender um, equality and human rights and, and, you know, to lead the advocacy efforts. So uh, during, um, during this uh, workshop, it was really highlighted, uh, you know, that women's network had significant challenges in engaging uh, the national global fund processes. So many of the women were really um, not understanding how it works, what is the process. So that was the reason behind we came up with the idea that the current assessment in uh, four countries, that is um, Vietnam, Cambodia, India, and Thailand. So recently we completed uh, three uh, assessment um, in three countries and still we are working in Thailand. So this was the baseline, as I said, and uh, you know, um, uh, we chosen those countries who are going to submit proposal uh, to GF in window two. So ICW AP requested technical support uh, to again with the TSM and then to support to uh, those countries to uh, conduct sort of uh, assessment. 
And the objective of the initiative was to support the engagement of women living with HIV in global fund, uh, in country process rather than regional, um, including country dialogue, you know, concept node development and grant making uh, processes to integrate women-led activities in the global fund proposal. So how we did it, I mean, uh, although we are still in the preliminary uh, situation, but how we did those assessment was like, through this uh, project, we uh, channelized a small part of funding for the country level network uh, for the, uh, to organize focus group discussion. And uh, so to share their uh, needs, utmost needs and priority, including recommendation and also to engage in the CCM activities and country dialogue so that they can advocate uh, for the inclusion of their recommendation in the funding request of the Global Fund. So we hired uh, two consultants, one was community and one was technical, and they did a desk review. We conducted uh, you know, 12 uh, focus group discussion with the women living with HIV and, and 14 key informant interviews were done. Uh, in Cambodia, India, and Vietnam, as I said, uh, Thailand, we are still working on it. And altogether, uh, 106 uh, women living with HIV were interviewed and involved in this process. We are still working on the report. Actually, as I said, we are still um, finalizing the things and some stakeholder meetings are still going on. So it is too early to share the findings at this moment. If I get chance, I will obviously say later when it is finalized to you know, um, share broadly. And I would say that uh, one thing like, you know, we were a bit late in uh, doing assessment because of a lot of process we went through. And as some countries were already finalizing the uh, proposal, but uh, for example, in India, women living with HIV were really able to negotiate. And, uh, you know, Cambodia, um, you know, for Cambodia, it was really shocking for us because 61 uh, women living with HIV in four provinces were in interviewed, no, five provinces. So um, none of them, a uh, single woman stood that saying um, they know about the global fund or existing ERB who is providing for them. So it was really sucking, uh, you know, um, and women living with HIV uh, were very much sad. And um, that was the thing. And as I said, the findings uh, cannot be shared at this moment. And finally, although we were a bit late to approaching to the countries, but I would say that the collected information um, and data from the countries uh, are really um, uh, useful tools for us and country level uh, in regards to advocacy for the other resource mobilization as well. And we are also working at the country level uh, UNA's office and other stakeholders uh, so that we can and, you know, build the sort of uh, understanding and collaboration with the other stakeholder at the existing countries level. And uh, we are really sad in, uh, you know, um, when we are talking about the uh, Cambodia Women's Network was uh, shut down. And it was, it was really hard to listening those women, 61 women who were participated in the FZD because there was no any single intervention directed to, uh, you know, uh, women and girls living with HIV. So I will stop here. And if you have any, uh, you know, uh, questions or, you know, queries, you can ask me and um, I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, Sita. And thank you for being able to share with us, even though that uh, the first step, uh, the first phase of, of the supporting uh, women in Asia Pacific. Um, with that, I also want to point out that we have a survey uh, with the help of the CRG ICW networks regionally. Uh, we are starting to circulate a survey to understand more about the extent of women in, women's involvement in the GC7. And I will put a link in the chat uh, for everyone to see and if you can fill it out. That way we can also track how we can support women. What are the challenges? How are the how we can help on the 
spaces and and also to 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 the renal leaders to give you support as well. If you have any questions to see that, please put it on the Q&A or in the chat. I see that we have a hand raise. I know Isabel, you will be the first one uh, that I will call on, 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 the, on our Q&A section. But I want to move uh, to also our next set of panelists. We have Olena and we have Speta that will share our their experiences. Uh, on on the Ica region, Sveta and Olena will be having their their presentation in Russian. So our interpreter will move to the English channel, and please, if you can move to the English channel so you can hear the translation, you can go to the world icon and choose the English channel as well. And. You, if you are in a device like a cell phone or a tablet, I think you can find the interpretation within the three dots. So I'm just going to ahead and give the floor first to Speta. Speta, I know you had trouble in audio. Can you hear us, Speta? I think she still has some connections trouble. Elena, can we move to you? No, no. Yes, I don't know. Oh, we lost Beta right now. Um, while she rejoins, Elena, yes. can we start with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We lost Sveta. That's why, please, um, uh, can could you share uh, screen with my presentation? And I will start. Uh, my presentation will be in English, uh, but I will talk uh, in Russian. You can see my screen. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Да, я буду говорить... Next slide, please. Я буду говорить по-русски, потому что я вижу среди участниц, представительниц моего региона и также из Украины. И хотела бы поделиться участием женщин, живущих с ВИЧ из Украины в процессах написание заявки и во всех процессах, которые осуществляются по Украине и поддерживаются программы глобальным фондом, так как это достаточно длительный эти процессы. Впервые в 2003 году глобальный фонд поддержал Украину и продолжает поддерживать уже 20 лет. И как раз от имени сообщества я принимала участие активное участие в процессе подачи заявки последней, которую мы подавали во втором окне. И хочу начать с того, что коротко рассказать про организацию. Наша организация называется «Позитивные женщины». Это национальное сообщество женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, которое объединяет участниц со всей Украины. Мы выступаем за соблюдение прав женщин в Украине, в первую очередь женщин, живущих с ВИЧ и уязвимых. ВИЧ. Также позитивные женщины продвигают идею вдохновения, всесторонней поддержки и развития для ВИЧ-позитивных женщин. Следующий слайд. Next slide, please. Угу. Как вы все знаете, в прошлом году, 24 февраля, в Украине произошло российское вторжение, военная агрессия со стороны Российской Федерации. И в связи с этим могу сказать, что деятельность и активности, которые внедряются и внедрялись в нашей организации, значительно изменили свой фокус. Если до 24 февраля это была адвокация доступа женщин к услугам сексуального и репродуктивного здоровья, участия в группах по валидации, элиминации и передаче ВИЧ от матери к ребенку, областных коррекционных советах. Также мы проводили и проводим мониторинг соблюдения прав женщин среди ключевых 
партнерок и партнеров, мониторинг насилия среди женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, в программах профилактики, ухода и поддержки как национальных, так и глобального фонда и других доноров. Также до 24 февраля мы начали работу, систематизировали работу пара юристок в Украине. Next slide, please. Но могу сказать, что э, произошли критические изменения в фокусе э, по предоставлению услуг, но э, также мы укрепились в связи с этим, и на сегодня 23 представительницы во всех областях Украины, кроме оккупированных Луганской и Крыма, э, представляют интересы женщин, живущих с ВИЧ в Украине. Также открыто э, 4 шелтера убежища для женщин с условиями проживания, в четырех городах Украины, Черновцы, Черкасы, Хмельницкий и Киев. Внедряется работа в безопасных пространствах в Днепре, Одессе, Запорожье и Полтаве. И также, как я уже упомянула, укрепилась сеть, и на сегодня это 32 пара юристки, которые предоставляют помощь и сопровождение женщинам, живущим с ВИЧ и уязвимым к ВИЧ в, на территории Украины. Также, как вы видите на слайде, это гуманитарная помощь, продукты питания, молочные смеси, памперсы, транспортные расходы, средства связи, пауэрбанки, теплые вещи. Это все то, что сейчас необходимо и продолжается потребность в этом для женщин, которые проживают в Украине. Также очень важный факт и направление деятельности – это служба психологической помощи и поддержки, включая группы взаимопомощи и помощи профессиональных психологов и психотерапевтов. Next slide, please. И также те потребности, которые я писала, они увеличиваются, они очень быстро меняются, но остаются все также необходимость системных изменений при оформлении утраченных документов для женщины, подтверждение и оформление инвалидности, еда, средства гигиены, одежда, лекарства. Все это сейчас необходимо для женщин. Также есть специфические потребности. Это доступ к антиретровирусной терапии, обеспечение конфиденциальности, диагноза, консультирование по вопросам приверженности, сопровождение, переадресация в медицинские учреждения – и так мы проводим эту деятельность не только в Украине для женщин, которые вынуждены переместились в другие регионы Украины, а также за пределами Украины. Также мы представляем интересы женщин в различных учреждениях, это медицинские и социальные учреждения, так как уровень стигмы дискриминации достаточно высокий, остается достаточно высоким в Украине. И также мы предпринимаем меры по сохранению психического здоровья для женщин и девочек, которые живут в Украине. Next slide, please. И сейчас я хотела бы перейти уже к основной теме нашего сегодняшнего вебинара, потому что я бы хотела перед тем, как об этом говорить, немного рассказать и дать вам информации относительно работы и деятельности сообщества женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, и о тех изменениях, которые принесла война в нашу страну. И начнем с того, что, как я уже отметила, в этом году мы подали заявку в Глобальный фонд, сейчас цена на рассмотрение в ТРП, и начали мы это подготовление в декабре 2022 года. То есть в прошлом году мы провели национальную консультацию с представительницами из 23 регионов для того, чтобы определить основные потребности и прокалькулировать, сколько же денег необходимо для того, чтобы покрыть те потребности, которые существуют у женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, у женщин из ключевых групп. Также могу сказать и для того, чтобы хотелось бы поделиться, что очень эффективные инструменты есть в каждом регионе и во многих странах. Это доступная такая возможность, которая предоставляется со стороны группы, которая предоставляется со стороны стратегической инициативы по комьюнити правам и гендеру. Называется она Community Rights Gender Strategic Initiative. У нас существует региональная платформа, но во многих из других стран и вообще CRG Group, она работает по 
всему миру, поэтому э, очень эффективный и качественный инструмент, которым можно пользоваться, подавать заявки для технической помощи и поддержки при написании заявки со стороны всех сообществ, и в том числе нашего сообщества женщин, живущих с ВИЧ. Next slide, please. А каким образом осуществлялся процесс и вовлеченность женщин, живущих с ВИЧ в процесс подачи заявки, разработки, подготовки и подачи заявки? Как вы видите на слайде, я указала основные пункты, которые, которые мы придерживались как страна, и во всех этих пунктах было полное вовлечение женщин, живущих с ВИЧ. Но очень важный факт. Для того, чтобы этот процесс запущен был и женщины принимали участие в, в нем, ключевое – это то, что женщины, живущие с ВИЧ, должны быть э, участницами, членкинями э, национальных советов э, по противодействию туберкулезу и ВИЧ-инфекции. Э, По-английски это звучит CCM, но во всех странах это название может отличаться, но э, суть ее в том, что это национальная платформа, основная, главная национальная платформа каждой страны, и важно, чтобы женщины, живущие с ВИЧ, имели отдельное место э, с правом голов, голоса, чтобы это э, голос женщин звучал, потому что я как... Э, Членкиня, участница Национального совета в своей стране, в Украине, не могла бы быть привлечена ко всем тем пунктам и участвовать во всех процессах, без исключения, если бы я не была членкиней Национального совета. Поэтому, если коротко говорить о том, каким образом развивался процесс подачи, то это был страновой диалог в начале года. После этого это была встреча, на которой обсуждались задачи, приоритеты стран и всех стейкхолдеров, которые были, присутствовали на встрече. И вот как раз это была первая встреча, запуск того процесса, когда все могли выразить свою позицию. И в нашей стране абсолютно все сообщества, которые существуют и представлены в Национальном совете, принимали участие. Потом была создана техническая экспертная группа, которая была утверждена Национальным советом. И важная часть того, что я в том числе была включена в техническую экспертную группу, несмотря на то, что у меня был конфликт интересов относительно того, что наши интервенции от сообщества женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, в том числе рассматривались и подавались. Но я, не, несмотря на то, что я не голосовала в процессе оценки интервенций, но я принимала активное участие и была на всех консультациях, которые проводились внутри страны относительно тех или иных интервенций. И очень важную часть, которую отметила ТА относительно пар и main allocation. Что это такое? Это есть дополнительное финансирование, основное финансирование. Так вот, очень важное, потому что я имею опыт уже того, что наши интервенции в предыдущих годах не попали, не все интервенции попали в основное финансирование. И можно сказать, когда они попадают в дополнительное финансирование пар, это, это равносильно тому, что эти интервенции никогда не будут поддержаны в будущем. То есть это, можно сказать, ну очень-очень маленький процесс что когда-либо они будут поддержаны и покрыты те потребности, которые вы прописываете, которые вы подаете. Очень важный факт – это оставаться в основном финансировании и приложить все силы, чтобы ваши интервенции вошли именно в основное финансирование. А после того, как была определена техническая экспертная группа, началась сама уже подготовка заявки. Были определены приоритеты, и потом была работа в малых группах. Могу сказать, что весь этот процесс у нас занял 5 месяцев. То есть мы 5 месяцев работали каждый день, мы обосновывали и очень много информации свои интервенции, также говорили и о других, потому что мы могли слышать те интервенции от других стейкхолдеров, которые принимали участие в этом, поэтому это такой был внутренний очень... Глобальный процесс, очень тяжелый, но, тем не менее, это возможно. И очень важно, чтобы женщины, живущие с ВИЧ, принимали в каждом этапе участие. А после этого у нас состоялась в марте текущего года встреча 
совместная встреча ПФАР и национальный диалог был проведен. И очень важно, что мы могли проговорить те стратегические пункты планирования ПФАР, которые проводились параллельно. Но, естественно, мы, мы обменивались информацией. И таким образом мы могли понять, какую часть интервенции потребность может на себя взять ПФАР, какую часть интервенции берет на себя глобальный фонд в покрытии этих потребностей. Ну, как я уже сказала, продолжились рабочие группы, работа в малых рабочих группах, и в мае было утверждено уже со стороны техни технической экспертной группы те интервенции, которые вошли в основное финансирование и в дополнительное финансирование. И 29 мая мы отправили от страны, это была утверждена заявка во время заседания Национального совета, была утверждена заявка и отправлена в глобальный фонд. Next slide, please. Какие же интервенции вошли со стороны от сообщества женщин, живущих с ВИЧ? Вы тоже можете их увидеть на экране, но несмотря на то, что мы изначально подавали 11 интервенций со стороны сообщества женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, как вы видите, в заявку в основное финансирование вошло 3. Но важно, что бюджет, тот, который ушел в глобальный фонд, составил немного меньше 1% от, общего, от общей суммы заявки. А общая сумма заявки составляет 165 миллионов долларов на 3 года, 2024-2026 год. Интервенции, которые вошли, это поддержка и развитие сети пара юристок, про которых я уже сказала. Это укрепление и мобилизация, поддержка сообщества женщин, живущих с ВИЧ на национальном и на региональном уровне. И это мониторинг доступа, мониторинг оценки барьеров, которые существуют у женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, при получении услуг в сфере ВИЧ и туберкулеза, и также адвокация изменений для того, чтобы преодолеть эти барьеры и мониторинг результатов. Next slide, please. С моей стороны это все. Слава Украине, спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much, Elena. And I just want to check if it's better. Oh, it's better. Will, uh, do you hear me now? Oh, yes. finally, thank you. Could you please share my slides? Yes, give me two seconds. Дорогие коллежанки, приветствую. Спасибо за возможность сегодня поделиться опытом Евразийской женской сети по СПИДу. Next slide, please. И в котором я, ну, я сначала начну, презентуя нашу организацию, которая объединяет женщин из 12 стран региона Восточной Европы и Центральной Азии. Нашим приоритетом являются три стратегические цели. Это доступ к услугам по сексуальному и репродуктивному здоровью и правам, противодействие гендерному насилию и насилию в отношении женщин и, конечно же, развитие лидерства и потенциала женских сообществ и продвижение того, чтобы их голоса и потребности звучали на всех политических уровнях и на уровне э, принятия решений. Next slide, please. А, наши основные ценности – это приверженность женскому сообществу, уважение, разнообразие, учиться подруга у подруги, взаимоподдержка, обеспечение, обеспечение обратной связи, гибкость и безопасность и empowerment. И теперь переходим к нашему опыту, который мы имели с работы с программами глобального фонда. Next slide, please. Наш опыт взаимодействия именно как региональной женской сети с программой глобального фонда, именно с региональной программой глобального фонда, это проект, первый проект SOS Project. Начался в 2021 году, это был уже третий год проекта, который реализовывался двумя основными реципиентами Альянсом общественного здоровья и всеукраинской сетью людей, живущих с ВИЧ, 100% жизни. Вот именно организация 100% жизни пригласила нас предложить интервенции, которые связаны с правами человека и 
декриминализация ВИЧ в регионе Веца. И в 2001 году мы реализовывали наши активности, и в основном эти активности были реализованы женщинами, живущими с ВИЧ. В первую очередь это документирование нарушения прав и в Российской Федерации именно женщинами и анализ этих правонарушений. Также мы оказывали техническую поддержку, координацию и помощь в подаче заявок в Комитет по ликвидации всех форм дискриминации, Комитет СИДО. И мы подали два теневых отчета от Кыргызстана и Российской Федерации, в которых обозначили основной темой именно дискриминация женщин, живущих с ВИЧ. Также мы провели обучающий хаб по декриминализации ВИЧ. Это был хаб как для мужчин, так и для женщин, но мы были очень гендерно чувствительными и имели фокус на такие важные темы, как доступ к дезагрегированных данных, когда собирается статистика о приговорах. Также мы большое внимание уделяли тому, как ВИЧ, декриминализация, ой, криминализация ВИЧ затрагивает женщин, почему и каким образом женщины страдают от криминализации ВИЧ. И также среди активностей была поддержка двум странам Узбекистана и Российской Федерации для сообщества в том, чтобы они мобилизировались, чтобы они собирали данные, проводили анализ. В Узбекистане обсуждение аналитической справки потом сопровождалось круглым столом с ключевыми стейкхолдерами и людьми, принимающие решения, и сообщество уже предлагала, ну, сначала аргументированно говорила о том, как люди, живущие с ВИЧ, затронут такими законами и предлагала решение. Next slide, please. И я хотела бы привести пример, как работа вот с договорными органами ООН, в частности с комитета СИДО, повлияла на то, что э, мы получили, вернее, страна Кыргызстан, но, я думаю, во многом повлиял наш теневой отчет э, в отношении женщин, живущих с ВИЧ. Э, мы получили очень продвинутые и для нашего региона, и в контексте женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, очень продвинутые рекомендации, которые редко, до этого момента мы имели такой опыт, чтобы были такие вот всесторонние комплексив рекомендации в отношении декриминализации ВИЧ, в отношении сохранения конфиденциальности тайны диагноза по методам ведения эпидемиологического расследования, по защите трудовых прав и недопущения требования справки об, об отсутствии ВИЧ-инфекции при приеме и удержании на работе. Ну и то, что имели случаи там изолирования детей от матерей в больницах. И в дополнение к этому еще сообщество женщин, употребляющих наркотики, лесбиянки, бисексуалки, транс женщины тоже получили очень сильные рекомендации комитета СИДО по пятому периодическому отчету. Следующий год, это уже был 22-й год, next slide, please, когда была подготовка уже нового раунда проекта СОС трехлетнего, и мы уже были партнерами в качестве членов консорциума приглашены, и уже Изначально наши активности, наши приоритеты были включены и планировались. В 2022 году наша основная деятельность была по четырем направлениям проведена. Это, как все хотела быстро сказать на русском сейчас, это исследование под руководством женщин 
и исследования под руководством сообщества в отношении сексуальных и репродуктивных прав, сексуального здоровья и репродуктивных прав женщин, живущих с ВИЧ в таких странах, как Сербия и Грузия. Также мы начали очень большую гендерную оценку, сфокусированную на женщинах, живущих с ВИЧ, секс-работницах и женщинах, употребляющих наркотики. Эта оценка покрывала 15 стран региона Юго-Восточной Европы и Центральной Азии. И также мы начали нашу активность, которая бы укрепляла потенциал женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, активисток, работающих в сфере ВИЧ в контексте ВИЧ и психического здоровья. И опять же мы продолжили работу по, с комитетом СИДО, по подаче теневого отчета в комитет СИДО. В этот раз была выбрана республика Узбекистан. Как пример, next slide, please. Я, как, как пример, примером служат наши инструменты и отчеты, инстру, отчеты по двум странам Сербия и Грузия, отчеты сообществ женщин, живущих с ВИЧ. И также мы разработали инструмент для активисток, которые, которые можно использовать для, для тех, кто хочет больше изучать интеграцию ВИЧ и психического здоровья. 2023 год, next slide, please. мы э, продолжили нашу работу, конечно, по гендерной оценке, потому что это действительно был большой такой объем работы, и э, сейчас мы ее еще не опубликовали, но находимся в стадии уже дизайна и перевода, и обязательно с вами поделимся э, в этом году, в ближайшее время. Также мы начали работу, и уже идет полевая работа по мониторингу насилия, видов насилия в отношении женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, включая факторы, которые препятствуют обращению женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, за помощью. И тут выбраны две целевые страны – это Казахстан и Молдова. Этот инструмент сначала мы использовали на региональном уровне делали большое исследование в 2018 году. Также такой мониторинг проводился в Украине, адаптировав региональный уровень к национальному. И сейчас у нас эта адаптированная методология в Украине используется для мониторинга в Казахстане и Молдове. Также мы продолжим активности по поддержке выбранных активистов, которые прошли обучающий процесс, и у нас создан такой пул экспертов, сертифицированных нашей организации, и они будут уже в своих странах эти активности реализовывать. И мы подали теневой отчет в, по правам женщин, живущих с ВИЧ от Грузии. Next slide, please. И примером э, по э, гендерной оценке является... Вот, мы изучили много вопросов, их трудно перечислить и презентовать, но одной э, из э, областей оценки у нас было значимое вовлечение женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, секс-работниц, женщин, употребляющих наркотики в процессы принятия решений. И, э, и также отдельно мы рассматривали э, в процессы, которые связаны с профилактика вертикальной передачи ВИЧ. И вот в частности мы обнаружили нулевое вообще участие секс-работниц и крайне низкая женщин, употребляющих наркотики. Хотя я считаю, что и, и, и для женщин, живущих с ВИЧ, 67% с 15 стран – это тоже э, недостаточное участие. Также у нас есть был блок по community led response, то есть э, ответных мерах по, по лидерству сообщества, где мы также оценивали участие в женщ, женщин э, в ис, э, исследованиям под руководством сообществ и как они проводились, также как, э, проведение мониторинга и смотрели деятельность зарегистрированных организаций, кто их финансирует и какие активности. Спасибо, что выслушали. Мое время вышло. И последний слайд, конечно, это 
Слава Україні, героям слава. Thank you very much, Sveta. Let me switch to original audio. Thank you very much, Sveta and Elena, for the amazing, incredible work you have doing in the ICA region. Um, great examples to share for other networks who are starting their processes. And I also want to point out, and I'm sorry I'm going to tell that we are going to pass the hour, but I really want to hear and share the experiences from West Africa. And we have invited um, the arena leader, Helen. Uh, Helen, I think Helen dropped off. Yes, yeah, sadly. Yes, so, you, you are right. Yeah, I think she had some internet troubles. While we wait through Helen, I then want to give the floor to Angela from Women for Girl Fund. And I see first that we have some hands raised and we are going to open the Q&A after Angela. So Angela, please um, share with us a little bit of the recommendations on uh, the name of the Women for Global Fund. Thank you, Karen. And I want to thank all the panelists for sharing these important insights with us. Um, can you share my screen? So I'll start. You share your screen? You share it, Karen. Okay, great. In the meantime, um, I think, I mean, I don't want to repeat anything that was already like mentioned by our um, our colleagues. I think they have shown like so many important points on this presentation. I just want like to share also the experience from Group of Girls Fund as we have been also engaged in window one and window two. Um, and what we wanted like also to strengthen that gender equality for meaningful participation in this grand seven cycle. Please the next one. Um, I think we have all like talk why it seems so important for, to have like gender priorities uh, during all these country dialogue processes. And I want to focus also on beyond this. And the main the main thing is that we want um, to work on awareness, understanding and advocacy and more women advocates in all diversity uh, to make the global fund processes, policies and investments like easier and friendly to understand and to navigate these processes, um, to work on the gender specific and transformative actions and advocacy strategies to have a meaningful participation. And what does it mean to have a meaningful participation? I'll, I will be telling you afterwards. The next, please. Um, and why we need to be engaged is uh, we really need to work on this specifically for adolescent women and, and the youth to have uh, this role uh, on the processes and to strengthen these advocacy efforts. Uh, it's crucial for us to foster this collaboration and partnerships among women networks. Um, as we are doing now, we are also sharing best practices and lessons learned. And it's also really important for us to focus on monitoring and evaluation practices. So we really have like um, a meaningful participation in all the designing, implementation, and the entire process of um, the funding request, the granting making, and also the implementation phase uh, after everything is submitted. For, uh, next, please. Um, I just want to recall something that is important for, for us to tell is like what is new in this grand cycle and why it's important for us to focus on gender transformative actions and how can we really take this to the next level on implementation, having a specific key indicators and having a specific um, funding so we can really know that this um, gender specific actions are in place. And here you can find some information specifically regarding to um, why what it's new in this grand cycle seven regarding to the gender equality um, and it's important that the global fund has focused some of the efforts um, a, a lot of efforts and we are also doing those things to remove this human rights and gender related barriers as the global fund and as we understand that if we don't eliminate these barriers to inequality, uh, we will not achieve a comprehensive response uh, to the three diseases. Um, and it's also key to understand that the Global Fund in the new strategy has focused on comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights um, and has put a lot of effort to advancing youth responsive programming for adolescent girls and young, young women. And there's a lot of focus on prevention um, and to have a, a more focused integrated people-centered services response specifically for women in all diversity. Uh, and as we 
also have mentioned in previous webinars and in this series with the colleagues, it's so crucial to have gender assessments uh, that help understand what are these barriers, what these are inequalities, what are the needs and what um, which are the impacts that are like, um, you know, like probably not helping us to move on this effectiveness of the HIV, TB and malaria response. Um, and also, like, it's really key for us to understand, like, what are these stronger roles of and voices of communities, voices of the women in all diversity, and how can we really get engaged on the different process? And I'm going to share some key recommendations and tools for advocacy and for participation afterwards. Um, it's really important also to mention the greater focus on accelerating this equitable deployment and access to innovations, how to use data-driven um, decisions, how to, how to conduct or have a decision-making based on data-driven and evidence-based information. And it's also connected to the gender assessment that we were saying before. Um, please, let's go to the next one. So I just like pass really fast to the um, recommendations. Um, and they're like important phases. Uh, and the first phase um, that I'm going to share some key facts is like the preparation phase. Um, and as you can see here, it's really crucial for all of us to keep on asking to be to keep on engaging with the different partners. Um, and we suggest um, to always like identify these key dates that are related to the country's grant. Let's say the submission window, the country dialogues and the CCM engagement ask, ask, ask. Um, you can request to the country engagement roadmap to the CCM and they can send those things to you. And you can map and see where can you participate as a women-led organization. Also, uh, try to map up key partners and stakeholders to collaborate with. I think like webinar spaces like this are really important for us to know who are working there, who can support us, so we can really learn from the others, share lessons learned, and also like uh, strengthen our capacity to advocate at the different levels. It's also really important to ask your CCM, ask uh, about the technical working groups and getting to know the country grant consultants and writers is also a key important fact in, um, as how you can also move forward on the advocacy strategy. Um, and also we are here, uh, Women for Global Fund is here also to support this kind of strategies on how can you engage uh, with other groups, partner networks, women-led organizations, and represent and have a voice of women in the diversity in all these spaces. The next one, please. So when the country dialogues are taking place, uh, it's really important to also map these dates for the country dialogues, to uh, coordinate with the CCM uh, to ensure that our networks, we as women are represented in the country dialogues. And don't forget also to ask about support to the community engagement and civil society, because um, you know, community and society representatives, we can request that to the CCM to provide funding for support um, to the 15% budget allocation intended for constituency engagement. And that's also something important that we need to know. Um, and also to reach our technical partners and other networks for financial support and capacity strengthening to ensure that this organization and community-led organizations and women-led organizations can participate and meaningfully engage in the country dialogues. So I think it's really important to keep in mind this, like always ask for financial support, technical support, participation, um, contact the networks, assist to webinars and engage as much as you can so you can develop this strategy at the country level. The next one, please. And in the process of developing like the funding requests and desire key recommendations we took from our experiences on the previous windows. Uh, and I think the window three will be also a really an opportunity for many other countries to learn from what we have been sharing today. Um, and there are like five to six key new things that um, are important for us to always recall on. And it's like that the, the grand cycle seven has like the program essentials, and these are like key evidence-based intervention that are based on the global guidance from 
organizations like the World Health Organization, the UNAIDS, Stop TV Partnership, and Roll Back Malaria. Um, and this is if this, these contributions that are like funded and are supported in the national level are um, connected to this, um, you know, like to these um, interventions with these partners, uh, the Global Fund consider it an opportunity for women and girls also to ensure that these funding requests are based on this global guidance and they are going to be supported in that sense too. Um, also, I want to talk about like how and how important it is to use the model framework for gender transformative programming. And please, uh, I mean, there are like so many resources we can share and you can also find those things. We can share also afterwards on the on the presentations and on the minutes of the report of this webinar, uh, how to use um, and how to get familiar with the model framework handbook. And here you can see in, in this handbook, a list of interventions and actions that are like prioritized and that are like funded and supported in the funding request processes. And for example, I, I want to give some examples of what it can be included and what needs to be included. So we have a comprehensive response. And for example, we have like empowerment, also like include activities and interventions regarding training on sexual consent, addressing gender norms and attitudes and um, autonomy also in decision-making processes, uh, gender-based violent prevention programs. I mean, there's a full list of interventions that you can find on the handbook, but I just mentioned here some of the important ones that I suggest that you always take into consideration. Please, the next one. And, and the other uh, important things that I wanted to mention are related to the gender equality marker, the gender assessment that we are as we have been also telling in this in this webinar, and the community priority annexed. Um, so these three other important uh, aspects are key to consider when you are developing the funding requests. And for the gender equality marker, um, this is just like to give a brief like a remand of what it is. This is a three-point scoring system that identifies whether like the gender equality is a principal focus on the funding request or, and how how core this is to the, to the proposal. And I suggest you to go, also go to this, um, you know, to more information on how the how to use the gender equality marker. We, of course, as a Women for Global Fund, are here to support. And if you need any other like information, or we can help and support your uh, your networks, we will do with information. You can also find more information in our web page on, on our webinars. Um, and also, we have been a lot of um, engaged with the gender assessments, and I think that. This is a really important thing, as also like Thea mentioned in the very beginning of, uh, of the webinar, how to really use this information. And if there's still not available, how to really engage with the UNAIDS offices or with the national partners there to conduct a gender assessment and to use this information for um, to understand better the needs, the context and the gaps that still need to be funded, that still need to have like a specific projects. Um, and when you have already have conducted this and you have the, the, the documents, please always like check with the UNAIDS office at your office or the regional, um, you know, like offices to see if there are like gender assessments available and review if the findings of the assessments um, are like in accordance with what you perceive the needs from your own network and advocate for this inclusion of the recommendations of the gender assessment in the funding request. And also, finally, I want to talk about like the community priority annex. Um, and this is something really, really important at, at just at the end um, to work with the CCM and the writing team to ensure that, that these priorities are included in the 20 agreed open interventions, because if they are not, it's going to be really hard in the, in the next phase to just like put those um, activities and interventions afterwards. But that's really key for you to focus on this uh, annex and to work closely with the CCM and the writing team to see and assess if these activities were already included. The next one, please. And I promise I won't take more time. Uh, so this is just a recap of the key strategies. Please uh, feel free to um, just 
follow us on the social media. You can find more information on these strategies. And we know that there's like a huge opportunity for us to still keep on working on the meaningful participation of women in all the diversity. And here you can find like the six six key strategies that I have already mentioned to recap. Work on comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights programs um, and the integration on HIV services for women. Let's keep on advancing youth responsive programming, particularly for adolescent girls and young women. Um, let's keep in mind how important it is to deploy quantitative and qualitative gender-specific desegregated data for, um, for the three diseases. Once again, um, conduct and use the information from gender assessments use the model framework for gender transformative programming and don't forget to check again like the handbook and the gender equality marker to evaluate like this extent of how focused it is the, the funding proposal related to gender. The next one please. And uh, as part of this also important project, I want um, I want you to please uh, feel free to join us in our campaign also, like social media campaign in which we have been portraying like women from all the diversity of different countries to share their stories, to share their key messages regarding how important it is for them, for us to be included on the CCMs, on the country dialogue processes. And if you want to share your messages here, you can also contact us uh, so we can also share those things on our social media, produce uh, short videos, stories, or key messages that can help all this momentum to build on the regional and global advocacy to understand the global, um, the Grand Cycle 7, but also to to, to share how it, how important it's our meaningful participation in the Grand Seven processes and beyond. Of course, the funding request is um, the um, one phase and there's like lots of opportunities of engagement and we need this uh, commitment and this work together for the next phases on the implementation evaluation and um, design also of new innovative and comprehensive responses for the three diseases um yes um, so the next one just like uh, opening like the, um, the space uh, for comments and questions and once again, thanks. Uh, muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Eh, spasiva. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angela. I just want to open a parenthesis here. I know that we passed the, the hour and some of our interpreters needs to leave, but we will still um, have the Q&A section. We have four, no, we have two people raised their hands. And before we move to the Q&A section, uh, oh no, Helen left, left us again. So I think we can move to the Q&A section because Tia also needs to leave in a minute and we don't want to keep her much, much longer. So Isabel, I know that you have been, uh, that you had your hand raised for the, most of the time. So please, um, please ask your question, Isabel. Isabel or I know that we also have one question in the chat. Oh yes, Sophie. Hi, uh, yeah, I think um I know that this question was answered um a little bit by Thea in the um in the chat, but I think it would be really good if um, we could review Alice's question, because I think this is a question that comes up a lot. And um, it'd be good to just understand whether what are the C, what CRG statistics are kept about women living with HIV, you know, engagement in CCMs and, and otherwise. Um, and then also, how are they tracking, um, you know, some of these, uh, the implementation? I just think it's a really good question to spark off discussion and, and get Thea to reflect before she has to run. <laughs> Oh, Sophie, can you read the, the, the question, please? Just I cannot yes. find it. The question <laughs> is, does CRG have statistics on the percentage of women living with HIV on each country's CCM? And, and uh, as I said, this has been answered in the Q&A, but I think it's an important discussion point. And are, is the CRG tracking um, engagement against, you know, how much 
investment in gender equitable programs are proposed and funded. So just a clarification on, on that, I think it's important. I don't think everyone can see the answers in the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm happy to respond from a CRG perspective and really interested to hear other people's reflections on, on how we can do this. So obviously we have to be really careful about any personal data that we're collecting and obviously um, very limited in, in our ability and the desire to share personal information. But saying that, we know that um, representation in key decision-making forums like CCMs and others are really, really important because we know that to maximize gender equality in, in what the Global Fund does, we need those two key elements. The first is that meaningful engagement and participation of women and girls. And the second is, you know, quality, impactful programming to tackle gender related issues. So what we're doing this time around is we're doing something new, um, which I think kind of gets to the point that Alice is making. And we're implementing a new key performance indicator. Now, it sounds a bit like a sort of global fund governance thing, but actually what, what we're planning to do is collect some of this really valuable information. So, so the information that we're going to collect is women and girls and gender diverse communities satisfaction with their engagement in global fund across the whole grant life cycle. So we're looking at kind of three key stages in that funding request development, in the um, implementation and then in the monetary evaluation. And what we want to do is actually ask women and girls how they've been engaged and, and how satisfied they were with that. And that's kind of a key difference as well to, to just being on a CCM or being represented, because as we know, unfortunately, just being there, being in the room, doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be listened to, but that our engagement is going to lead to, um, you know, uh, changes in the design and implementation of, of Global Fund grants. So we want to understand from women and girls themselves how well they feel and they've been able to engage. So we're going to do a new survey um, as part of this key performance indicator where we're going to collect this information. So we're collecting it across the board for community engagement and then we're specifically focusing as part of that on making sure that we collect that information specifically for women, girls and gender diverse communities. So then we're going to start building up this picture across all of the countries um, about being levels of engagement um, and participation. And, and then what I think we'll be able to do with that information is obviously <laughs> where there's challenge engagement challenges, you know, um, prioritize those. But also, like Alice um, refers to in her question, look at the link between, you know, engagement and programming. And that's why we've got these two elements of the KPI. The second element is um, looking at the country specific data on program performance in relation to gender equality. So for each country, we'll have the information relating to engagement and also to programming. And then we'll be able to directly look at you know, the crossover between those. And obviously what we expect to see is those countries where there's greater engagement and participation, we expect to see stronger programming. Um, on gender, and I think that that will be as well a really um, a really key bit of information for us to be able to continue to make the case for that strong engagement. Um, so that's what we're planning to do, and um, it, it it's a new thing for us, but we really want to make sure that we're capturing the meaningful engagement in the best way that we can. Thank you, Thea, and I saw Olena also raising her hands. Uh, да, я знаю. очень хочу добавить, и спасибо большое, Теа, за <coughs> ответ относительно этого вопроса, но если мы говорим о значимом вовлечении женщин, вот я хотела сказать, что тогда, когда я говорила о пяти месяцах работы над заявкой, это э, моего времени было около трех-четырех часов ежедневно, участие в рабочей группе. 
И если мы говорим о значимом участии, я считаю, что мы должны параллельно говорить о том, чтобы финансировать организации под управлением женщин. Потому что когда у женщины нет денег на то, чтобы или у нее есть какая-то дополнительная работа, и ее активизм – это ее вклад волонтерский, то она не может 4 часа отдавать на эти процессы, потому что ей нужно деньги зарабатывать, чтобы ребенка прокормить, понимаете? И когда мы говорим о значимом участии, мы должны параллельно говорить о значимом финансировании женских организаций под управлением женщин, вкладывании денег, чтобы они развивали, чтобы это было их работой. Спасибо. Is to ask women their needs, what they need to have a meaningful engagement, not only have this paper participation, but like the holistic part that we also that we also talked about. If they need some financial support, I know that most of the women in in other countries are participants in CCM are not having that kind of support. And that's also one of the barriers for the meaningful participation. And one of also the things that you yeah, point out is to have this not survey, but mapping. The, the importance also to have this kind of mapping and how many women are going to engage and that also how we can work around um, the data that we have. And I, and I want to ask Angela this question about the survey that we are just launching this week. Why did we launch this survey? How are we going, how are the results going to help uh, improve the engagement of women? Thanks, Karen, for this. And I also very much agree with what Olena has just mentioned. It's like really important in the, the participation of meaningful, uh, meaningful participation of women in all this process. And this includes design and implementation, evaluation and monitoring. It's not only like sitting on, you know, on the CCM and have like one space to talk. Um, I just want to make the short also this point and I will take one minute also to say that um, why we're doing this specific survey in coordination with all the partners is just like to get this information written, to have the data also from our side so we can really advocate with evidence. I think it's really important that we share spaces and dialogues, but we need to pass from that this idea of um, communicating things orally to have really serious statements and technical documents that can help like countries and can help other organizations to understand what countries are experiencing what women in the diversity are experiencing in the national levels and that's why we are asking also you to please take the time uh, to fill this form and share with us this information and we are going to use it with, a, uh, with the purpose of really like moving forward to the next level of engagement and advocacy um, and it's really key to use this information the gender-based information from the realities of the countries uh, and also we will be sharing in the next in the next days also information in our website about like what we have been doing in some countries to support uh, women and led organizations uh, in the window one and window two um, so we can use this lessons learned from window three and beyond. So thanks, Karen, for the space. Thank you, Angela. And I saw that uh, Helen is here Please. with us. She has yes. technical yeah. problems. And I'm going to give you a guess, a few minutes, just to set us off and, and, and the webinar with your last reflection and the experiences of West Africa. Yes, Go thank ahead. you very much. Uh, Karen, can you hear me? Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. OK. We can. Hello, uh, I've had issues with my network. I, I apologize, uh, honestly. Um, I want to use this opportunity to thank my uh, regional director, Azomta, who has given me this space uh, to speak on behalf of uh, the West African region. Uh, my name is Helen Afan, uh, a member of the ICWW, West Africa, Nigeria to be specific. Um, for issues, we have issues in Nigeria, and uh, I want to say that uh, the HIV pandemic uh, in West Africa generally uh, is fluctuates from region to region, with um, Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire having uh, a strong burden uh, of uh, 3.4, 3.5. Uh, uh, prevalence, and that has 
ensured us to, to be very proactive and to ensure that uh, the voices of women are heard and we, we, we do the needful. Um, I also want to say that uh, the burden that is high is something that has affected women in the community, especially uh, young women and girls and also uh, indigent women generally who are on drugs. And uh, also to say that uh, our resilience within the HIV response space is, is active as we speak. Uh, we have not allowed the dwindling funds to limit us. Uh, and also you, you will agree with me that women, girls and children are susceptible to the tripartite uh, diseases, TB, malaria and HIV, uh, which is um, ravaging so much on the lives of women, especially women living with HIV. Uh, but so far, so good, we have been able to uh, ensure that women, uh, uh, the health seeking behavior of uh, women is tremendously um, on the rise. We have encouraged them to, you know, to take decisions, even when they are denied their rights, they should also take decisions. This has been enforced through uh, sensitization within the communities across board. And uh, we have also had feedback meetings with various regions, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and other countries that we work together to synergize uh, uh, HIV response. We have also engaged women network, especially in Nigeria and other West African countries uh, to ensure that those regions are giving productive synergy for us to plan and execute projects and activities around SRH, uh, GBV, PMTCT, and I'm, I'm very, very glad to know that uh, Global Fund is having a, a very keen interest on PMTCT uh, services. And it is something that we, we hope to work around very well because the burden of new infection has always remained around Nigeria, especially. And this is something we hope to cop as we go further. So the success of all this, including um, getting women in their diversities together to ensure that no, no person is left behind has been ensured by the regional coordinator uh, Asomta. And I can tell you that there's an all-inclusive uh, pro project across uh, West Africa. Um, this is something that is very, very key to us. But um, we are we are saddened with the fact that non-inclusion of women-led organization in implementing projects that directly relates, uh, relates and concern women and girls issue is, um, is a concern to us very well. And donor funding is not adequately provided for us to sustain very critical and prevention intervention. This is a setback to success and uh, affect quality data reporting. Uh, successes we have made over time can be truncated if uh, donors uh, are not actually attending to our needs. We want to owe our activities. We want to owe our projects. We know where we have issues. We know where we have issues. And we can only speak for young women and children who cannot present their issues appropriately. So the women-led organization can provide a platform for uh, partners to, to get to hear them properly. So we recommend that um, we can change the narrative of PMTCT and other HIV thematic interventions. If grants and funding support is given to women-led organizations in particular and across countries, this will allow us to strive in community sensitization and quality data reporting. We also um, look forward to co uh, collaborating with stakeholders. We are very grateful with ICW Global, and uh, we are glad to, to hear from uh, 
uh, the Global Fund uh, Women Woman representative that has just made a presentation, we will use uh, all avenue to ensure that what she has told us to do, we do it across the countries and regions. Uh, remember that nothing for us without us, so we are in this together, we should collaborate and ensure that no one is left behind. So thank you very much. Um, I have so much to say, but uh, I think my colleagues have said most of them and who communicate subsequently, and I hope to send my uh, presentation to Karen and Sophie. Thank you very much. We are grateful. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you for pointing out the work that you have done in West Africa. And, and you said some of the things I already pointed out because we can see these synergy, these connections about those some challenges across regions. We have Asia Pacific, we have West Africa, ICA. And also, we also see how we can support women, some of the lessons learned in other regions. And I just want to, th to thank all of you, Elena, Helen, Nita, and Tia, and Angela, for being on this session, for having this sharing knowledge space, of having these um, important key discussions about how we can move on after window one and after window two and how we can support better. Also, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, I saw a lot of discussions, interesting points point out in the chat. Um, just letting you know that the presentations and the recording webinars will also be in um, the web page that we just shared earlier, but I won't gonna share, share again right now. And also thank you for the interpreters for staying uh, a little bit more. I just want to wish you a very good afternoon and a happy weekend. Thank you, everyone.